Okay, so um, welcome everyone. If you don't know yet, this is UA Video Game Developers Club. Um, we're a club on campus that focuses on getting multiple disciplines to work together to create games. And in addition to encourage people on campus to start their own game projects. Um, our purpose statement used to be that we want people we want to help people to get a job in the game development industry. It's still a part of our purpose, but we also feel that we want to expand video games to a more general audience who's not perhaps interested in making games professionally. Um, basically, this generation of people all grew up playing games, and we're all interested in, well, many of us are interested in seeing how it's made. So. Um, for that group of people, we, uh, the club is a good place for them to be too, because you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be entirely focused on wanting to make games and getting into the industry. You can just have fun making games. Um, so the club meetings are on every Monday, 5 p.m. in this room, and in the meetings we generally talk about, um, we really talk about anything that's related to game making or even just aspects of games that maybe doesn't relate directly to the process of making games. For example, today Dylan, our vice president, is going to talk about narratives in games. Even though it doesn't directly correlate with how you make a game. Um, you guys totally distracted me. Yeah. Even though, it, even though it doesn't directly correlate with making a game, it's still a very important aspect aspect to consider when you're looking at the bigger picture. So in addition to meetings, um, one of the bigger events that we're planning for the semester, come and take a seat, we have an open chair here. And there, we can probably sit one more people on the couch. Or there. Yeah. Okay. So one of the bigger events that we're planning for the semester is the game jam. Game. So this is a 48-hour game development marathon, and we're planning on holding it on the Veterans Day weekend. Um, in game jams, you basically come and team up with other participants to make a game revolving around the theme that we announced at the beginning of the event. Um, it's really fun. I think we have a bunch of people here who went to the game jam last year, if you can raise your hand. Would you say it's fun? Definitely. Yeah. Will you, will you come back for the next game jam? Definitely. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. It, it's a lot of work, but it's really awesome. It's really worth it. Right. And you get free food for the entire duration. <laughs> so free food is always good. Um, plus, this is a very awesome thing if you haven't made a game yet and want to just get your hands dirty on starting to make a game. Um, right, that's just that. Um, we also are planning to hold at least three different game development workshops. Um, the last two, we haven't decided the date yet, but the next game development workshop will be on September 28th. Um, we're going to send an email with all these info so you don't have to write it down or anything. So basically, for the workshop on that Saturday, we'll be teaching the game loop. We'll be teaching how to make a game from, um, how should I say it, programming languages as opposed to languages that are specifically designed to make games or tools that are specifically designed to make games. And we also hold game nights on Fridays once a month. Um, for the game nights, we really just bring our own consoles in and we set up, we have a huge TV here. Other people bring their own TVs and computers in. We have a LAN set up in the back. And we just have fun. Um, we usually get, we usually have food and drink. Sometimes, sometimes it's free, depending on whether CS department gives us money, but. Well, you should still well, donate it? anyway. It's, it's always free. It's just, we have a food fund that you can donate. <laughs> <laughs> you should. 
Donation is appreciated. When is the first game night? The first game night is next Friday. It's this, it's this Friday. Friday. <laughs> it's the next Friday from today. <laughs> yeah, I have a problem with the word next. Stop making no point of reception. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Have I touched on everything? Um, let me check. So I'm thinking of doing introductions also. I just realized I didn't say my name. Um, so I'm Zuming Shi. I'm the current president of this club. And I think we plan to have people say like something interesting about them. But Use that bowl right there. There's a lot of people. Don't do, don't do, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Let's just introduce the officers. Right, let's introduce the officers. So, Dylan, you're the vice president. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I forgot my other title. So the officers have a second title. My title is final boss, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> official title. <laughs> my, unof my unofficial title is president. And Dylan. Oh, uh, I'm Dylan. <laughs> my unofficial title, I have two of them. One of them is old man in cave. Uh, like at the beginning of Zelda, because he gives you the sword, he gives you the power to build games. Uh, <laughs> the, old man the other one games. is mini boss, because obviously. Um, and yeah, vice president. Who's next? I'm, one of, I'm always in. So I'm Livio. I'm the secretary. I'm the former president. I started the club almost three years ago, and my official title is Save Point. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm Cindy. I am the community outreach officer. What is my official title? Do we Our outreach the marketing. Bar? Oh, on the bar. <laughs> That's right. Tyler just got it down. I just got this. <laughs> no, you're standing up. Everybody else stood up. <laughs> All right. My name is Jonathan. Turn around. I'm face the, them. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, so I'm the treasurer and my unofficial title is The Road. Thank you a lot of money. <laughs> we have one more. Patrick. Yeah. So, and I'm Patrick. I'm the club cinematographer, so I'm basically taking recording meetings now <laughs> and um, generally doing a lot of media stuff for all of our events, so. <laughs> You'll see me probably wandering around taking pictures a lot at our other events. So. Right. He up, he records the meetings so we can upload them to YouTube. Oh, and let's see, my job title, I have two apparently. Let's see, two, let's see, Shy Guy and Lakitu, which, <laughs> if you don't know, Lakitu is the little annoying guy in Mario that, like, throws the spike balls and <laughs> stuff like that. So, <laughs> yes. He's the guy in Mario 64, if you're him. Yep. If you play Mario 64. <laughs> All right. So basically now, um, should we? Sure. Let's do it. Okay. Um, where should we start? Any volunteer? I'm gonna make everyone stand up. So my name is Grayson. Uh, I like making games, and I make. I started making games on this website called Roblox in 2008, and since then I got 15.5 million. Gameplay is total. Wow. So, I'm here for the, the thrill of actually making real games based off of uh, other programming language other, other than Lua, which is only well, one I know so far. I'm not in Java in computer science right now. Hmm. The next workshop will be perfect for that. The like, really powerful for scripting. Yep. Game games, so mm -hmm. scripting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Lua? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back, Rose. Uh, okay, I guess. Uh, I'm Curtis, and uh, I guess I'm here because uh, games are a point of interest for me. I, I might consider uh, going into game design, because uh, right now I'm, in the, I'm a math and computer science major. So. Cool. So, my name is Carly, and I'm a freshman in engineering, and I like games, and I think it would be cool to know how to make one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, we started the train. Fight the power. No, no combo <laughs> breaker. <laughs> um, I'm Tane Carter. I've never made a game in my life, but I've played games, so I guess that counts. <laughs> 
I want to make. <laughs> I want to make games like I don't know what kind. It involve yeah. killing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. You are perfect. All right, making weapons. That's designing weapon designs. Um, yeah. And I haven't. I'm gonna major in gaming, I guess. Yeah, I am. Okay. Not this. Um, hello everybody, I'm James. I, uh, I took the ISTA 251 class last year, so that was a game design class, and uh, I found it interesting and I thought I'd expand that interest. So, you mind if you raise your curve? Hey guys, I'm Tom. Okay. Computer science major. Yeah, he did. He is awesome. <laughs> All right, I'm Sean. I'm a complete and total waster, so I thought I learn some discernible skills. <laughs> I do stand up comedy, so I like to write little quips or funny lines, maybe put them in a game one day. I'm Dave. I'm, I'm in this room. I'm in this particular meeting because I, I love game. Oh, what? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So I'm in this particular room and this partic for this particular meeting because I love I love video games, whether it be the design underlying them or just the idea of building one. Hey, I'm uh, I'm Tyler Wallace. I'm a senior this year. I have been with the club since. Uh, since Livio founded, yeah, this is the first meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this uh, I'm a computer science and math major right now. I want to be a technical artist, so that that's a combination of programming and the art for video games. Uh, Continue. But I met a guy from Bungie this summer nice. that does that. So. Awesome. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I, I do a lot of work in uh, like 3D 3D environments, so uh, some Blender. I, I'm gonna pick up Maya eventually here, um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, I, I've worked on a couple of game projects. So one here with the university, <laughs> and a few with the club here. Uh, yeah, there you go. Former Oh yeah, I'm I'm the former bard, so that's how I knew the uh, the title there. <laughs> I tried to usurp Dylan for his position here and failed, and so oh, yeah. I, I now live in disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> we still love you. Um, let's Just start. Oh, yeah. Just disgrace. Um, what about him? Oh, yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Yu Hao. I'm a CS major. I'm here because I love game, playing, or designing. Yeah. One of the <laughs> 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 I'm Carlos, um, I'm a grad electrical and computer engineer. I like games and just considering that I'm here, I just came to see a little more cookies. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to take yeah, those. Yeah, By the way, we do have free cookies in case you don't know. <laughs> 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 Speaking of which, there are, there are cookies over here if you guys want some. So. Oh, you can pass it down. Yeah, we can pass it down. No one else wants cookies. Thanks. Grab me. Okay. Get close to one there. He works next door. Or basically runs the building. So, we close the door. Why do you know we close our door too? Wow. It's the vents. And then uh, I was here last year for the Game Jam event. It was really fun, and it was my first time experience to make game with Livio, and he's a master. So I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, it was really interesting, like how we were just doing everything from scratch, and we actually made a really fun game. And I really enjoyed it. That's why I'm here. I'm Alex. I'm a computer science major. Um, 
I've been playing around with general game designs for a while, but haven't actually got a prototype working, and I make crappy Minecraft plugins. So. <laughs> uh, I'm Josh, I'm a freshman pre-computer science major. Um, I'm actually a hacker, so I kind of came to learn how to build something instead of breaking it. <laughs> Like you said, like there was a uh, course pertaining to natural course pertaining to games. Yeah. yeah. There is. There are multiple. Yes, that's you. There are multiple. There's a department. Oh, no. <laughs> no. no. Uh, Go, perfect. Are there any requirements in order to do Actually, no, there's not. No, I don't think so. Not anymore. Right. Yeah. There used to be like a program. I want to do it later. Yeah, but that is not. Yeah. Why did no one like you? No you one told me either. Well, now you know, guys. <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone ever comes back to teach it, there's also <laughs> just a 451. Uh, oh, the, it's the, the one that Wesley Kerr taught. Yeah. It's running again? No, I'm no. saying if anyone ever comes back. There is a professor who's planning on teaching that. Uh -huh. uh, Angus Forbes, he just oh. came to the CIS department. Like, he just got into the department, so cool. he's, he's, he's doing um, human-computer interaction and cool. computer uh, art-related uh, stuff. Yeah. Hello, my name is um, Tim, and um, though I'm not really experienced in more of the developmental aspect of games, I am an avid consumer, um, StarCraft, <laughs> and maybe some Counter-Strike a little. <laughs> maybe I'll hope to uh, pick up a few things in this um, It'll be really fun. Hey, I'm Kevin. I'm a sophomore EC major. Um, I like crazy things, so maybe I'll find some crazy in this club. <laughs> <laughs> well, the same tape. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Jake. I'm a computer science major, like everyone is, but um, <laughs> I like games, so that's, that's why I'm here. I am Francis, I'm also majoring in computer science, and I've been interested in um, 3D animation and design for a while because I've been messing with like 3D Max and Source Filmmaker for a while. So that's kind of why I joined, so I can get better at that. The games are nice too. Hey everyone, I'm Larry, um, computer science major as well, uh, senior this year, and uh, I a lot of games with everyone else here, so I decided why not join them for making some. I'm Harvey, I'm a computer science major. I've had a large involvement in the club since last year. Uh, I'm a sophomore this year and hopefully we'll continue to be involved in the club, helping out. And stuff. Uh, my name is Fernando. This is my first time here. pre computer science major and hopefully I'll um, hope to learn stuff about it. So. Hi, I'm Steven. I'm a junior in computer science and I want to be a game developer. Awesome. Okay, we didn't miss anyone. Cool. Yeah, cool. Um, so now we're going to have our first presentation of the semester. Dylan, our vice president, is going to be presenting about game narratives and. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if you're interested in giving a talk, on any topic related to game development, really talk to Dylan because he's the person responsible for planning these meetings. Oh, yeah. I should probably, <laughs> I should probably put that link on the website, I guess. Um, we have a form. If you want to give a talk about something or if you're interested about something, you should definitely sign up to give one. Because we technically don't have anything planned. And if you just like want the spotlight for however many minutes, Sign up like immediately and you'll probably get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's also pretty really fun to get speaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Giving presentations is good. And and very formal here. Yeah. If you're interested about something, like 
and don't know much about it and nobody knows about it in the club, why don't you just like research it yourself and then give a presentation? Because I'm willing to bet tons of people would love that. Yeah. I'm just adding a slide really fast. Because <laughs> I finally thought of the example I was looking for. Hey, is that good? Hey, good that's from the from last science semester. fair. Yeah, that yeah, was from the uh, science fair. Two song fair. festival. Amnesia, some oh, yeah. monkey head. I don't know. Viral <laughs> <laughs> bear. Because by the way, if you're interested in adding comedy into games. Yeah, I got it. Viral bear. Wonderful game. Okay. Pass off. Hey, look at me. Where am I? Where am I? Actually, I don't know. Photocopy the flyers. Were they driving me around at that point? Oh, no, no, there's no, a, there's a video of that. that. I'm not you playing the video. Alex, have the music in the background. Whoa, Sorry, that's more. way too easy. Like, oh god, no, go away. <laughs> Spoilers. Bottom <laughs> tip. Okay. okay, yeah, so our watermark is definitely like all up in that. Um, you know, this means, I don't blame you for being confused. This is like, what are you like? <laughs> Just put it on your shirt and then clip it to your hip. Put it in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> no, Harvey. Yeah. No. I mean, should we erase this? Okay. I think we can. I think everyone can figure it out. Yeah, you yeah. can like look for the Facebook group. It can group. be. It can be copied over. You no. Know? Yeah. Will, yeah, you can just rewrite it. We'll or put something. this back up at some point. <laughs> That's fine. That's <laughs> at the very can top. You explain what the IEEE room is. So, Go ahead. We're in the IEEE room. The IEEE. Um, <laughs> our so they are the institute of. I forget the <laughs> electric, <laughs> electrical engineers. Electronic and electrical engineers. They like the redundancy. So they're they're in a uh, computer engineering and electrical engineering club. Um, they had their first meeting two hours ago in this room. Some of you were there for that. So the, we are using their room um, because we do a lot of things together as clubs. Like the game night is going to be in this room, and so it's going to be a joint event with the IEEE club and the game night. Yeah, that's who the IEEE is. So yeah, also, this room is open from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., Monday to Friday. And it's basically, you can come in here and just use it as a lounge, use it as a hangout spot. A lot of our members do that, and it's a really nice place to go. If, you don't have, if you're on campus, you don't have anywhere to go and you want to work or eat, you can come here and you'll run into members. And that's great, pretty awesome. Go. All right. <laughs> so, oh man, that thing's going to be there again. Oh well. Um, yeah, so this talk is a little general because, I mean, it's the first meeting. Not everybody is into everything. Um, so this is pretty much just about the scope of game design. I guess that's, that's what you would end up calling this. Um, but it's definitely titled something else. It's titled <laughs> The Language of Game, Stories in the Simulation Dream. I don't know. I thought Wind Waker was like, I don't know. That game gave me good vibes. When that game first came out, I was just kind of like, why did they sell shade everything? But now, it kind of fits. Eh, whatever. It fits. <laughs> it fits. It fits. It fits. It's wonderfully fits. <laughs> it's comfortable. OK, I'm sorry, Dave. It fits <laughs> like a dream, <laughs> like everything I've ever wanted. So um, pretentious. OK, so <laughs> language of game, what? OK, yeah, so I'm being very like artful in the way that I word this. I don't think anyone would be able to really define it. It's super broad. But it's definitely something you can hear a game speaking to you when you're playing it. Uh, and it's, it's something you don't really need to know a language to understand, except, of course, if you don't read the language that the game is in, yeah, I guess you probably won't be able to understand it. <laughs> but aside from that, if there's like Mario, if there's no real words in that that you need to know. It's something you can just kind of feel that's right. Um, so, oh yeah, it's really quiet. Anybody hear that noise? Yeah. What was that noise? The coin. Right, the coin in Mario. But on its own, it's kind of like this little tinny thing. Eh, it's all right. 
But in conjunction with this picture, it just kind of feels right. Um, and this is going to be a progression. Right now, this isn't quite what I want to talk about in this talk, but this is an example, and it's a pretty large part of the language of game. So I thought I'd at least cover it, which is, I don't know, something about that really tinny coin noise and the way this ugly shape jumps out <laughs> of that block. It just feels right. And maybe, maybe that's in part because it's so ingrained in pop, into pop culture and all of our memories. But I like to think it's something more than that. Um, so this is getting a little closer to what I want to talk about. And Earthbound, it's a great game. If you haven't played it, you should do it. It's wonderful. Um, it's great in like every way, too. It's not too hard. And the story is just like really fulfilling. I don't know. But the point is, at the very beginning of this game, you encounter this dude named Pokey, who is a complete jerk. And you can tell he's a jerk, because at the very beginning of the game, um, you end up going outside to investigate some kind of happening with your dog. And your dog is nice, and when you encounter evil birds, or like dogs, or just random rabid animals, your dog helps you kill them, uh, and fight them off, and defends you, and stuff like that. And then later, you go back home, because you can't find anything, then this jerk comes banging on your door and is like, no, you have to help me find my brother. Like, oh, he's lost, blah, 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 blah. And so you go out to fight with him and quickly realize that he's not going to help you fight. It doesn't say that, but while you're fighting, where you would expect your dog to be like, yeah, look, does 10 damage to this thing. It just says, like, Pokey, like, runs into a corner and cowers and cries. <laughs> and... I thought that was excellent, because it's, it's not something that they blatantly throw at you that they're just like, Pokey is a jerk, remember this. <laughs> they let you feel this hatred toward him, because you <laughs> hate him. You feel this through the gameplay itself. And that's just, that's so perfect. That just feels right. Like, they get the game through to you by playing it. It's awesome, awesome. Uh, another smaller example is that whenever you encounter enemies with psychic abilities, you're just kind of like, whoa, what just happened here? And you can tell that that place that you're in is special just simply because of that. And they don't say, this place is special, or the enemies will now have psychic abilities, but it's just something that comes up and you're like, what? Like, they can do that? What's going on here? Um, even closer, and this didn't resonate with some people, but it really, really struck a chord with me, which is in The Walking Dead, if you haven't played it, um, it's basically a choose your own adventure. It's like watching a show where you sometimes pick up like the mouse and like click something, basically. But it's really good. It's, it's hard to explain, but it's pretty excellent. And something that I thought was great about that game is that they made the characters feel so much more fleshed out and gave you a much more personal experience with the game by this one really simple line. So you have this girl, Clementine, following you around and her parents are gone for some reason or another. Uh, it's a zombie apocalypse, go figure. And she has to learn all these life lessons from you instead of from her parents. And so whenever you make a decision that she's watching or that will impact like the way she thinks about the world, it says Clementine will remember that at the top of the screen. And I don't think I've felt more guilty in any <laughs> other game than when I did something like awful and then it's like Clementine will remember that. <laughs> and you're like, Oh, I just ruined this little girl's life. It's, I thought that was excellent. And some people think it pulls you out of the game. But I think that creates a great emotional attachment to the character itself, but also to the way you play the game. And so what's the progression here? We're going from just kind of like, yeah, it feels right, to creating this attachment with the game, this personal experience that you're deriving out of it. And that's really why we play games. Like, what is a game about if it's not about getting the experience you want out of it? So the, the point is basically that it's not just you kind of experiencing something. It's that that experience becomes personal to you. So Thomas Grip, it's really cool. Amnesia, a machine for pigs, comes out in seven hours now, probably. <laughs> uh, I just checked. Not me. <laughs> He helped design that game, was the main designer of that game. Uh, and I really like him, not just because he made those games, but because he has a lot to say about games. And it's usually something like really, really cool. Uh, 
I can't get into a lot of it, but really something that he talks about a lot is like, story isn't just the plot of the game. Like the plot of Amnesia, eh, sure. But it's the experience that you get out of the game. It's the story that you create within the game that you kind of feel. And I thought that's, yeah, that's like perfect. The story is not just this plot that you're being forced down. It's what you take out of the game yourself. So character setting, anything you throw into the game is just a tool for the player to take and get an experience out of. And that's awesome. So because it's interactive, because the player gets this experience out of the game, you can actually let them do a lot of the work for you. And that brings me to this word, apophenia. What does that mean? Well, it reminds me of this stupid meme where, or not just a meme, it's just a joke, where it says there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who can extrapolate from incomplete data. And those who can. No. And the joke is that in order to understand the joke, you need to be able to extrapolate from incomplete data. Like, that's, that's the point. Um, and that's not quite true because everybody can do that and it's what makes games fun for a lot of people. Um, technically, the definition is like, it's seeing random, or it's seeing patterns in random or meaningless data. But I want to expand that a little bit. Okay, hopefully this is not. Oh yeah, so I changed the video. So it's no longer that weird song. It's a less weird song <laughs> that has a worse example, but is less uh, weird. Weird. <laughs> weird is not the word. Okay. You can ignore this. It's th it's the main thing that he says that's important. Obviously, this is the Bollywood thriller, but. <laughs> so why am I showing you this? I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're done. We're done. <laughs> so, those were popular when I was little. Um, and they're awful, but. <laughs> so, I don't know, can anybody guess why I showed you that? Because you're trying to find meaning out of, like, we right, don't right. speak that language. If, if you don't speak that language, that. It's, it can be funny because you're like, it really does sound like he's saying girly man, uh, just that entire song. And so that's the kind of apophenia that I'm getting at, is seeing something that's meaningless and saying like, oh, and deriving this experience out of it. So Simlish, the language that the Sims speak, was actually developed by linguists, if you didn't know this. So like that blathering gibberish that they say, like people actually design that language to sound like a language, which is kind of cool. Because have you ever seriously like been playing the Sims and thought, oh, I've heard them say this before. Anyone? Mm -hmm. Yep. You have? Yep. Really? Yeah. Like you've heard like the okay. Which Depends which play. Sims. They <laughs> they tried to expand it a lot. But the point I'm trying to get out of this is like, if you're playing the Sims, it's a lot harder to hear the same thing multiple times because you don't understand it. Like it's just kind of gibberish to you. Um, and they actually tried it out with English when they were designing the game, so Will Wright. That's, whose win was that? Or Sir Patrick's? <laughs> anyway, um, Will Wright, when designing The Sims, was like, you know what, like, let's try it with English. And they did, and The Sims just sounded like robots. You would hear the same thing over and over again, and be like, oh, they're just doing this thing again. Whereas, it's a lot harder to come across that while you're playing The Sims, because you don't really understand what's going on. Or not. No, I didn't. Just clicked on the wrong thing. So how do we like create this? Obviously, they sort of like tried, but is it reproducible? So Tynan Sylvester, he worked on Bioshock Infinite. Um, he thinks you totally can. And he has this list of stuff that you can do to try to get people to fill out the blanks for you. So like make your job easier when you're designing the game, right? So if you borrow archetypes from real life and fiction, if you, I don't know, you have the same old hashed out princess dragon guy saving her story. 
you can actually just kind of barely hint at that, and then the player will be like, oh, like I understand all of this other stuff about their world just because they kind of hinted at this one little archetype. Um, if you allow the player to project themselves into the game, I like this one. Um, that's basically anything from creating your character to just naming stuff. In Earthbound, some of the most personal experiences for me was when I named like his dog or his favorite thing or his favorite food as like a dirty word and then it just like <laughs> comes up randomly in the game and you're just like, did they just say that? <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, and I don't know, that's what I took out of Earthbound. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think that one's especially powerful, but you can also create in certain situations with human relevant values and the balance. What that basically means is you want to choose something that makes sense to people that they would actually care about. So this is a bad example, but if you had a game that was about a robot and a robot universe where they were taking away all the metal and they made the robot very sad, it's hard to get attached to that because you don't care. <laughs> like, you're not a robot and you will not be sad if they take the metal away from you. <laughs> Whereas if you're playing a game about someone who is about to be like left alone forever or is dying, you can actually kind of get something out of that and pull this emotional attachment. It's just basically a way to derive from this person's past experiences an emotional response by simply hinting at some kind of human relevant value. Um, and then you can also just use simple pure primal emotions. I think this is kind of a weird one. But he's basically saying, don't use like hipster emotions, like convoluted, sad, like I, I don't even know. <laughs> just, just don't use complicated emotions. Use simple emotions like anger. Um, and I think that's that's basically the same sort of thing that he's getting at here. Is just get something that they have a lot of experience with and bring it up because then they'll understand it more. Um, so, getting back to this. So what's a game? Like, not that. That's, not that. that's not a game? That's 100 hours. I'd say that it's a, a game. Simu like 130 hours into that. Well, are games not simulations? Some are. I think the word simulator has been kind of misused. Um, because when I think of train simulator, really what I would expect is to play as a train. Like, I want to be the train if I'm playing train simulator. Um, the point in that is, I think every game is basically a simulation. Like That's sort of the reason you play it. If you want to get this experience, this foreign experience, as something else, it's a simulation where you are that thing. So I, like, there are plenty of other examples, but I keep bringing this one up. Brutal Legend, a game is like, awesome, but it's a simulation where you're a roadie who gets sent back in time, kind of, to a different universe and uses the power of metal to save the world. <laughs> um, and it's a simulation. You can live that out through the character in the game. And that's what I want to get across, is that every game is kind of like a simulation. And so you can actually apply a lot of the stuff to simulations that you can apply to other games, which is the player model. The entire value of a game or a simulation is in the thing that the player gets out of it. It's basically saying the game model is what you put into the game, and the player model is what they experience. So. If you put this crazy complicated system into the game and they just walk left instead of right and completely ignore it, then what was the point of that? They didn't get that out of it, so it didn't get injected into the player model. So the way these can differ, and it stinks, uh, there are two examples, Ultima Online and Bioshock. So when they were designing Ultima Online, there's actually this really, really cool ecosystem they were putting in there, which is like, if you kill too many of this animal, well, then the thing that feeds off of that animal will run out of food supplies, and then that other animal will like, go searching for food somewhere else, and chain reaction, and then like a dragon gets really mad and runs into a city and burns the village down. And so you can have all these crazy like, reactions like that happening in this game. They were like, yes, this game is going to be the best game like anyone's ever played. And they released it, and all the players ran in guns blazing and killed everything before any of that could happen. <laughs> so the point is... They put this great stuff into the game model, but it's not something that could realistically come out into the player model, so it was kind of pointless. Uh, the same thing, same thing with Bioshock, except they saved themselves this time, is before, 
they used to have this great relationship between splicers and big daddies and little sisters where they would like hunt each other and do this kind of crazy like triangle thing. Um, but people would just play it and wouldn't be able to tell. You can't see it because you can only see so much at any given point, especially in an FPS. So they just took it out because there was no point in leaving it in there. It was just added complexity. So how do we win? How do we get stuff into the player's head? Like, yeah, basically, how do we not get it lost on the something room floor? I don't know how to parallel that. Um, so that same guy who gave us that list, I was like, well, you should probably just use the simplest representation for the kind of stuff you want them to get out of it. So again, if Ultima Online is a game about having a community and killing stuff, well, then maybe you don't want to put this entire ecosystem of random animals doing their own thing in there. Like, maybe that's not really what's important to the game experience. Uh, and he has a lot to say about simulations. But the thing that you can sort of take out of that is he's like, well, accuracy can actually be really bad. No one wants to play, like, a perfect simulation, which is not true as far as I'm concerned. But I think the point that you can get out of that is that a perfect simulation isn't really feasible at this point in time, so you might as well just stop and not try. Um, but yeah, accuracy can be bad in that sense, because he thinks if it's too accurate, it stops being fun. Which, eh. Yeah. I think a prime example could be GTA 4. You know, like how GTA 3 was kind of just fun and just, you know, messing around and mm -hmm. stuff. And when it comes to GTA 4, they're trying to be too realistic. And while aka like public accuracy in the gaming sense, then people would probably just don't really want to play the game anymore because it was just way too realistic. It's not fun anymore. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like, um, I think this is something that Elder Scrolls went through. Uh, which, it makes me sad, but it also, like, it does make sense to some extent. So, like, anyone play Arena, Daggerfall, or Morrowind? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, there's just, like, so much you can choose in that. They went, they went kind of, like, crazy with choices. Uh, I mean, aside from character creation, which is something I'll talk about in a second, but aside from that, there's, like, a lot of stuff that you can do. Um, and noticing the difference between Morrowind and Oblivion is even, like, huge. You can see that Morrowind has like all these subclasses of stuff that you can do in Oblivion, which is just one one thing for all of it. And it's like, it feels sort of like you're being cheated. Like, well, I want to do like this specific thing and be really good at this thing, but not that other thing. But I mean, they did the same thing from Oblivion to Skyrim, right? Like, if you've done that, you'll notice like the skills get even smaller. They just try to generalize everything. But maybe it's because the game isn't even about all of those small things between weapons. It's about killing things. Uh, it's about going on those adventures and exploring the cave. Not as much about having a very, very specific class of thing to kill things. Maybe. I guess that's the conclusion they came to. Uh, so the second thing is use hair complexity for cheap fictional flavor. Hair complexity, the example is hair in Fallout or just character creation in general. It's not something that seriously impacts the game, except in the Elder Scrolls, which is cool, but it does matter. Um, but in Fallout, like, if you give your character a mohawk and you run around in the world, is anyone seriously going to come up to you and say, hey, you with the mohawk, I'm going to kill you because you have a mohawk. <laughs> no, you're not going to encounter that because Fallout's not a game about hair. <laughs> no one cares. Like, it's hair complexity because in this whole tangled mess of complexity, it's just kind of sticking off. Like, it's not in there. It's just something you can tack onto the game and not make it really more complex. Um, and I don't know. I think that's really strong, just like adding character creation to make the game uh, more fulfilling. Uh, a thing where it went wrong. I didn't have this in the last presentation, so I added it because I thought it could use an example of where this sort of thing went wrong. Actually, I'll talk about this first. Um, so what can we learn out of this? Well, think about what your game is and have it speak the right language. If your game is not about hair, don't add in like crazy <laughs> hair physics and like a billion different choices of color and everything and add like new palettes, uh, create like an entire rendering engine based on hair. Like that's not gonna help. I mean, you can do it, but you should really focus on what your game is about as opposed to, I don't know, just things that you can throw in there. 
Um, complexity isn't inherently bad, but make sure it's necessary, yeah, basically. Um, and with apophenia, if you focus on what's important, like, I don't know, actually playing the game, like the core experience you want to get out of it, you can use apophenia to let the players get all the rest of the stuff that they could be getting out of it, as opposed to putting all of that in your, there yourself and spending time doing something you shouldn't be doing. So the counterexample of this is Spore. Um, I was super excited for this game. Who wasn't? Huh? Who wasn't? It, it sounded amazing, right? But then you actually play it, and each stage itself. So the the great thing about the game was like they were like, yeah, you'll be able to evolve from like the smallest cell to like a crazy interplanetary seafaring like race or whatever. And you're like, yes, I want to play that. But when they finally actually realize it, you realize, oh well. You can play as the little cell, and that that's kind of fun, I guess. And then you can play as the little dude, and yeah, it's okay. And then you play as like the tribal stage, and yeah, I mean, it's like it's, it's like a really watered down version of Civ. And then you play the higher stage than that, and it's like a less watered down, but still very watered down <laughs> version of Civ. And then you get to the space stage, and it's like a really simple space collect spice thing. And you realize like. Well, because they had to do all of these things, that's what the game was about. Like, they spread themselves so thin that if they just focused on, like, one of these stages, it really would have been a much better game. Spore made me sad. <laughs> Spore game. What was oh, well. EA? What do you expect? There was one really cool thing about this game, which was that it would download uh, creatures from other people's games to, like, randomly populate your universe which got bad when people started realizing yeah. that they could make things they shouldn't be making. <laughs> like animals that look like certain Alex, things. Alex off, yeah. And so like you come down on a planet and see like these horrible like genital monsters running around and you're like, okay, I'm leaving this place. <laughs> but yeah, point is understand the scope of your game and stick to it. Uh, and I think that's something everybody can benefit from even if like you're not particularly interested in designing the game. Because, I don't know, working on each individual piece, you can consider this. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and back to the slideshow. <laughs> oh my we God, have guys. ice cream and cookies. Yeah, we have cookies left. This ice cream was not the one. No, we're just missing cake. That's it. Oh, ice right. cream cookies. No one really wants to get rid of these cookies. So. <laughs> you want to get rid of them? Please take them. <laughs>